Namaste and good evening to all. We resume our online sessions of ICDA today with a very eminent guest, Vidya Subramanyam. Let me briefly introduce our speaker of the day. Vidya Subramanyam is an eminent Bharatanatyam artist acclaimed for her sensitive choreography and emotionally charged performances. Trained under Gurus S.K. Rajaratnam and Kalanidhi Narayanan, her artistry has earned appreciation in India, Germany, France, UK, Russia, Afghanistan, Kenya and USA. With an MA in Theatre Arts, she has enriched her artistic experience with forays into theatre and film as well. To introduce her, let me quote a write-up from the English daily, The Hindu. Vidya has a perfect sense of laya and lavanya, rhythm and grace. Her nritta is impeccable as if it is flowing in the swiftest of footwork. She manifests a fluidity that keeps us glued to the stage. The stances are chiseled to perfection. The Sanchari Bhava is poetry in motion. If this sums up Vidya's pure dance aspects, well, her Abhinaya is like the jewel in the crown. It left the very artistic, emotional audiences enthralled and fascinated. This is from the English daily, The Hindu. Vidya Subramanyam is a recipient of many awards. Nadana Mamani from Karthik Fine Arts, Chennai. Yuva Kala Bharati, Bharat Kalachar, Chennai. Award for Excellence from the Music Academy. And she is also an A-grade uh, empaneled artist of Dhuradashan. Vidya Ma'am, thank you so much uh, for agreeing to spend time with us. Namaste and a very formal welcome to the online series of ICDA. Namaste Ma'am. Thank you so much, Reshma. Would you like me to go ahead and start? Okay. Well, Namaskaram to everyone. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are present, how many of you have joined. Um, but hello to everyone who is watching and who will be watching later, poss possibly. Uh, thank you for inviting me to be able to present in these unprecedented times online for ICDA. Thank you, Reshma, for uh, having me. Um, I just want to offer my condolences uh, to those of you who knew Sri uh, Gopakumar, who, who was the ideator for this series, I believe, and Reshma has been conducting it wonderfully. I've watched a couple of the episodes as well. I'm very sorry to hear of his loss, and we've had to postpone this um, as a result, but I do applaud all of your energy in continuing to, you know, continuing with the series so that we persist with the sharing of arts, um, which is extremely important, especially in times like these. Um, so thank you. And uh, today I will be talking about the power of Lassia, which is the title on the flyer. Uh, this talk will be sort of aided with a little bit of demonstration here and there. And it is uh, based on my somatic experience over the last 45 years or so of dancing. Um, and in the second half, we'll have some questions, I believe. So the word Lassia itself has made several visits into my life since I was a young um, teenager. Every time I performed, just like you just read out uh, an excerpt from a review, um, there would often be the word Lassia attached to uh, the review, in the review. And at that time, I sort of understood it, you know, to mean just simple grace or the idea of moving in a dainty, smooth, feminine, attractive manner. Um, a lot has changed since then with uh, my understanding of this word and uh, how it um, is formed in my dance itself. And then I later on, of course, went on to name my school, you know, dance school in the US last year. 
um, because it seemed like a natural extension at that point. Um, I will, um, like I said, present some excerpts. So what I want to do today is straight away start with a small excerpt uh, of dancing and then I will continue the talking. So um, right now, so I'm going to get up and then I just want you to tell me if you can see my entire form and I am going to... Can you hear the music? Thank <laughs> you. 
I wanted to highlight that composition because obviously it is rich with lasya as we understand it. So now what does the word lasya conjure up in our minds, right? From a very long time, we've heard of it as referred to the goddess, Devi, the feminine aspect of dance. And we think daintiness and benevolence and soft glance and all that, right? The words themselves in a composition like this, for example, Mridu Pankajalochani, Manju Vashani, Mandagamani, all um, sort of require this gentle, graceful gliding movement. But last year, I want you to step out of that and think about it as not merely what we have understood it to be. The word, to me, actually conjures up energy source. The, the, it is the source of all energy. This energy source in the whole universe is actually feminine, where there is no stagnancy. It is flowing, it is distributed, it um, has movement, it's mobile, and it is never static, right? So there is... And then the masculine energy, we understand it to be inertia. And so the two are required to complement each other. Now, last year, the feminine energy itself is sort of like this, the, the womb that allows everything to create, to be created from. And from that emanates all energy and all creation. And that travels outward. So from inward to outward, right? So that flow itself. Now, when we think of it in this way, um, it sounds beautiful conceptually, but how do we then translate it? What does it mean in movement, in dance, in Bharatanatyam, or uh, whatever form we are practicing each of us, right? First of all, let's take the physical. Um, we hear this comment made about, especially female dancers, which I have a bone to pick with about, um, that, that her dance was filled with lasya and filled with grace. So are we talking merely about elegance and uh, flow of movement? Is that all it is? It seems to be something more than that, right? To me, the source of this grace, the source of all this elegance and grace is actually counterintuitive when we think about it. It is strength. It is the core, the underlying, almost that womb that I was talking about, where there is intense, immense strength that we are building from. So like, almost like Ardhanari, this idea of strength and idea of grace have to coexist. They have to work together and they have to borrow and lend from each other, borrow from each other and lend each other and sort of work synchronously for there to be this idea of grace. So it is not just about loose movements or, you know, flowy movements. It comes from an, a place of intense strength. And so we must build our physical strength, first of all, when we think of this, uh, um, trying to embody last year, right? So um, if we don't do that, what happens is the independent components of the movement. For example, you saw the choreography I just did. If um, the strength, if it's not coming from a place of strength, there tends to be 
disjointed movements, each one may be showing um, grace separately, but where is uh, the continuity, right? That con in order to maintain that continuity, we need strength. Um, so physical strength is a must. And then it's also about flow. The idea of flow, flow between movements. So gliding from one movement to the other, gliding from firmness to softness, and then from pull to push. It's almost like a spring. That tension is held and then it's let go. So energy is sort of held and let and we let go of it. So that idea itself is um, when you understand the physicality of it, it manifests as lasya in the um, ritta especially, right? And now here I want to stress though that although I spoke about strength, strength is supremely important to build for lasya. However, you know, my guru SK Rajatam used to say, um, even the most difficult jatis or difficult movements, you must make it appear easy. And um, what does that mean? How do, you, how do you just make it appear easy, right? It is because we learn to not exhibit the strength. We have the strength, we build the strength, but we don't show it off or we don't exhibit the strength. So it's not about, um, so the Varugurbani especially is known for that last year and that uh, idea of uh, flow. So we don't, we learn not to show up or exhibit the strength even though it is there. So sometimes it seems like the dancer is not really strong, but the movements are actually extremely difficult when they, and I've had uh, people try it and then realize how difficult it is. It's just that we learn to make it look easy. So it's not about exhibiting the strength, but it is about containing it within and using it intelligently to let it flow through the grace. And then I also want to talk about transition between movements, right? I was telling you earlier about that. Now, again, like I mentioned, first part, the first aspect is that the movement itself is not seen in its individual components. It is seen as one thread, one long thread. So that the whole, uh, that is one part of it. So each movement if we take, and then we also take, if we take the whole body, the body as a whole, it is one entity and it's moving in unison. So when you saw this, uh, for example, even the walk, right, manda. So it's not that the hands are moving by themselves or the leg is just, foot is just being placed one in front of the other. It is that the whole body is engaged in that mandagamani. So that she is that mandagamani, right? So that sway is everywhere. So, and that's just a walk. But if we take adavas or any execution of jatis also, it's the same. We take that forward in those as well. And um, so it's, it's, I mean, I cannot stress this enough in that I always, when I teach my students also, I keep talking to them about this flow, this transition between movements. Um, and not just between movements, it is between uh, one line to the next line and then between each stanza to the next stanza and the whole composition therefore is like this giant arc that we form with mini arcs, right? So it's very important to understand how your body works through these transitions. Next, I just want to talk about um, how when we think of last year, earlier we talked about the fact that we think of Devi, Goddess. But to me, um, he is grace personified as well. Any, if you take Shiva, Krishna, all of the male characters, the so-called labeled male characters are also grace personified. So it doesn't have to be a Parvati or a Lakshmi to be uh, graceful, right? So there's, there are, when we take this even beyond that, each of us contain masculine and feminine, feminine energies. They're sort of uh, working together within every single human being. And again, you know, so I believe strongly that, you know, in Parvati's Lasya, there is strength, in Shiva's Lasya, there is uh, grace. 
vice and then you take tandava it's the same thing so each is a combination and how that combination works is up to each of us to explore based on what that um that uh, flow of energy you know masculine versus feminine or masculine and feminine energies within each of us so this shifting between masculine and feminine feminine energies itself is what is it except ardhanari it is the idea of ardhanari so we cannot separate and say it has to be a devi or a parvati you know for that last year to be um, felt or seen so i just want to demonstrate a really short excerpt from a composition um, another composition so what can be more graceful than the idol of nataraja the flow of movement from top to toe when we study that iconography right i'm sure most of you have from the circle of fire that surrounds him to the way his jata moves to the ganga that flows to the calm repose on his face to the abhay the way the abhay is held not necessarily or is you know that softness and that the hand that softly gently points towards salvation to moyalaka and that form where the leg gets lifted everything the top to toe i can't think of a better example of flow and grace so what i'm trying to say is we don't have to limit it to female characters now taking this even further the idea of lasya let's look at you know we all dancers we love to talk about the idea of yearning and it is so um strongly present in varnams especially where it's you know an aika yearning for a specific god that has been written in that composition but now i want to 
stress that this naika is not necessarily only female as we understand it it is the idea of feminine energy seeking to be one with masculine energy like we talked about right at the beginning so it's not necessarily always just a woman and a man that's too simplistic a way to look at it right so when we look at this merge of feminine and masculine energies again we are talking adhanari that seems to be the thread running through today's talk but in a varnam it is so beautifully embodied in that uh, uh, that yearning that the naika feels so naika does not have to be just um, a woman per se yearning for a man right now a lot of compositions a lot of varnams of course were written on kings and written um you know those are also gorgeous now i'll talk about about that uh, a little later um but i also in, when we look at a varnam how how many other ways can we explore this word lasya let's look at that of course there's lasya in the jadis in the nritta like we just talked about now if you take it a little further to me the lasya exists if we think of it as the flow it exists between the jati and the sahityam also to me in a varnam the jati and the sahityam the jati is not okay if i do four jatis and then in the sahityam and the naika throughout i am that naika in yearning from the beginning of the varnam to the end of the varnam she is one naika in yearning so there is no divide as this, as such between the jatis and the sahityam so it's a flow that you established there so that flow is also lasya now little further when we take this you know the seeker and the sought can be multiple energy sources the seeker is the na is placed in the position or the character of the naika but she you know as a as an entity that is allowing i mean uh, seeking is allowing energy to flow outward as well so in that yearning and that seeking itself there is energy flow and that then comes back and that is or hopefully it comes back because that's what she's yearning for so these multiple energy sources there's flow between those itself is lasya so to me this perfect example of um, a complete lesson in lasya is the varna um how are we doing on time do i just have a few couple more points but do i have time, do I have to, time demonstrate to demonstrate go on please ma'am yes go on short text from, from a varna okay so this is um sadan in the kunde just the words sadan in the kunde my yell mind right so i'm just going to take that and i want you to just observe um i you know through the small sense because this comes in the charanam these are not very long sancharis through the through the kutti sancharis we i you know where that flow of energy is and then how it then flows into the next swara let me see what time it would be 25 so <laughs>
half of the varnam obviously the intensity of this yearning is at an elevated level but then when we come to the second half in the charanam there's a playfulness there's a there's a almost a familiarity in that yearning familiarity with uh, the yearned the seek you know the seeker and the sought so um one more idea of last year i want to talk about is drishti and the word drishti itself uh, cannot be reduced to just mean glance it's so much more than that um and i'll say very little about this it is the idea of focused drishti what does that mean it's not just where you're looking right so if you are you looking uh in front i mean in a theater in a theater of course we're all told look above the audience um but it's beyond that 
that focused drishti comes from a place of being present being always in that moment no matter where in any composition you are you are forced to be in the moment you cannot think about what you just did a couple of minutes ago in the uh, in the composition whether it is varnam or tilana you cannot think about what is going to come you are in the present moment so when that presence is there and present moment is that and then there's also the presence of the the way the stance is all of that is exhibited in the glance the in the drishti and then when we take it to mean uh, in another way it's also this idea of grace through compassion grace through graciousness and just compassion for all beings empathy that itself to me is is uh, the idea of grace through the eyes the idea of lasya taking to another level now one more way to look at i talked earlier about you know tandava lasya shiva parvati but when we look at krishna especially i want to you know reiterate i've spoken about this before but i want to repeat that especially if you take an ashtapadi you know, krishna does not have to exhibit any preconceived notions of how his body language should be or how he should act you know it's not necessary that that is the only stance so here there is this passionate love for radha which is all consuming so he is consumed by it and he wants to be consumed by it and he wants to consume radha and he is confident he is gentle he draws her in with his magic and charm and yet he surrenders himself to her completely so there is so much you know flow of energy in in that uh, equation in that love between them as well these tender moments that they ex- exhibit so the idea of male female you know disappears so how the character holds them so there are two aspects to it right you the dancer what are your multiple uh, gender energies and then the character that you are portraying there are multiple gender en- energies in that character as well so uh, this i will not demonstrate because there is a video there are videos of my ashtapadis um online if you take a look i'm sure you will be able to see that uh, what i'm talking about then there is also um and this is the last point i'll make there, there is also lasya in music we are in um collaboration with music always when we are dancing and even when there is silence in the music we are hearing the music and to me this is the other flow between music and dance between choreography and movement that sort of meshes itself beautifully with the music that there is lasya in that itself that is also lasya that flow between music and dance um so we have to be very cognizant of where that um energy is coming from the musician and give in return so that there can be this constant flow of energy between the two and it's not at any point that they are singing for you or you are dancing for them right it is not about that it is that it is a collaborative flow um so those were pretty much uh, the points i wanted to make today it's a, of course we can go on but i uh, i want to stress again i mean if i were to repeat i would talk about that one concept of the midline the apanari which is a flowing line it is not a straight sharp line it is always curved always flowing the energy is uh, this way and that way often and the idea of fluidity and idea of lasya does not have to be put in any boxes like i explored many ways to look at lasya today that i'm sure there are more ways if uh, each of you think about it um so we don't need to label i mean put them in specific boxes and also i want to say find the lasya in you as the dancer not in the dancer you admire it is that is their way of looking at lasya but who you are and what 
how you dance is determined by your own flow of energy, like I said before. So discover your own lasya through that hard work because um, lasya is harmony with the energy source, ultimately. So that's uh, what I wanted to say for today. Thank you again, Reshma, and uh, we can open up for questions if you want. Sure, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh... So we definitely do have a lot of questions, more like an interaction. Uh, while I'll also request the audience to start uh, uh, either typing your questions in the chat or you can choose to unmute as well. Uh, while I probably post some of my questions. Um, so ma'am, these uh, questions are actually a combination of uh, what you spoke today as well as some of your earlier work as well. Uh, for example, Draupadi and uh, as well as uh, the Friday uh, Feminine, which you have been doing recently. Uh, so a combination of all of them. And today when you talked about um, not boxing oneself into a certain notion. But my first question is um, when we portray a male or female protagonist in a traditional format, have you felt restricted or is there a certain refinement that always needs to be put in? But while we perform outside a traditional, there is more scope to be liberated or free. Okay, there's a lot of words I want to um, take out of this question. But let's look at a, a few things. First of all, the word tradition itself is loaded, right? It's very loaded. Uh, today, we know what it is. We, when we all learned it, we understood it to be different. But it's a, a, it's, it's a word that encompasses a lot more now. There's a large scope. So now, what is tradition but what was? And what, you know, it was what it was flows and becomes tradition in the future. So it's not something that's stagnant or one way to look at. And if that were the case, then none of our arts would have survived. Second, when we look at, um, you'd asked about restricting, right? So um, you look at you look at a Varnam, you look at an Aika, like the way I just depicted her. Where is there any restriction in her? So she is as much me, as she is the Naika. So, and I've written, I've written an article about this. If you are able to find this, it's um, character and self. I'll, I, if you reach out to me, I'll send you the link later. You can share it with the others. Um, but that there is always this intersection, again, Ardhanari, intersection between Naika and self, Naika and Vidya. So it's not purely, that you're portraying some outdated Naika from a, from whatever century. Um, the composition may have been written that long ago, but I make it mine by infusing it with meanness, right? So there is a sort of meeting point between her and me, and that is also not a straight line, it's a curved line. So where she join, begins and I end is not you know, specified, and each time it changes. Each time I portray the same Nike. I just recorded this Varnam yesterday for Federation of Sabas, and it was different. How I did it today was, you know, so it's that flow of energy between her and me is not um, set in stone. So when that is the case, I don't feel, I really don't feel like I'm portraying somebody from a different era or somebody that's outdated. Um, now, when we look outside the Bharatanatyam Margam, uh, so to me, let me repeat, the Bharatanatyam Margam is no way restrictive. It actually allows me to explore um, all of my emotions in a, the most cathartic manner one can. And it is something that uh, reveals me to myself, the Margam, especially the Varna. Um, so I understand myself better through these compositions. Now, when we take compositions or uh, works outside of the Margam, like you just asked, um, and we are exploring problems or um, um, 
issues that are plaguing society that's a whole another area i've worked in that uh, space as well and it's um, you know it's very channeled right in that situation it's very channeled towards that character so if I, if i take draupadi um i am looking at her from not just the mythological point of view not from the mahabharata point of view alone but the way she would i mean because in still i rise for example um if i take that as an example draupadi exists everywhere among us um we are still seeing so much uh, violence and abuse against women so it's not it's not ended uh, nothing much has changed so when we take her from that we sort of i sort of plucked her from the mahabharata and found her in every woman who was uh, that includes me and every woman in the audience and what is that connection how do you make that connection then becomes the reason or the catalyst for your choreography so it depends on what you want to say right so what um, and and again this is something i say as well so we we choose subjects because they affect us because um it's not something that i can be without exploring i have to explore this subject only then i do it it's not for the sake of what some okay people want to see this so i'm going to do that right so that's not why so when it's coming from that inner space of desire to work on because i am moved by it then you are going to be authentic with it so there also i'm finding myself so really what is the difference right so i am still uh, me but then i'm navigating these different characters and uh, one is more of narrative and more of uh, the ideation that the concept of uh, you know tying her to the a current issue and the other is exploring emotions through these um time tested heroines so i really don't um, i don't feel much different in both these realms and i it's i'm equally comfortable and joyous to be exploring it yeah i hope that answers it yes sir. and some of the But, words that you mentioned right now um outdated uh, compositions uh, not stagnant uh, so when you do your latest uh, creations that you're working right now uh, or when you're working with uh, probably some of your younger students is there a constant dialogue or debate how to bring out a character with attributes that are let's say real world for today's times yeah so i i think i sort of answered that in my previous answer in the sense that yes we do to answer the first part of your question yes absolutely with my students we have conversations about this and not just about the naikas we are portraying but conversations as women as everyday women as mothers as uh, as wives as sisters as daughters um and then understanding that those are not our only identity tags that who we are is more than all that and beyond all that so we have conversations about all of that and so the larger idea of femininity is what we would converse about which then manifests itself in compositions in a way almost seamlessly when you don't in a way you don't even realize it so when we talk about anaika i mean if you know if i for example um if i you know teach a, a javali like era rara uh, which i which a lot of my students love she is someone who is um he has their mic approaching him with a sense of confidence and boldness and there are compositions like that and then there are compositions where um uh, she is um being shy and let me say shyness is not a bad thing or a wrong thing it's just how you feel it's just a, an emotion a feeling now when we 
the other aspect to this is also that when you're learning, right? Um, Kalanidhi, mommy, I've le- we've le- we've all a lot of her students. We've learned these compositions. When we learn, when we were learning, we learned them as you know compositions with our, which are sort of almost exercises in understanding abhinaya, exercises in understanding womanhood, exercises in understanding um, how to use your body entire body in that abhinaya and how to use the hastas so it is not that we often tend to you know think too much too early in the sense i'm not saying that dancers should not think uh, this is you know if you've read what i've written you know that that's the opposite of what i think um but sometimes it's important to just dance and be the you know to understand the character it's only when you dance over and over and over again the same composition that you actually at some point somewhere begin to understand her so before we do that when we start to think about why am i doing this because it is not relevant or it is not relevant to me we've already decided and we put a play you know put this wall in front of us and said she's not relevant to me but we can explore these compositions and then understand which of these and there are so many compositions which uh, some of which uh, i for example love to choose compositions where the uh, where the naika is talking directly to him not through a sakhi where she is uh, um very comfortable in expressing her emotions to him so i choose compositions so that but that choice comes at a time after a time when i've learned all of those so, it's not um, naika so we cannot write her off that easily so with my students yes we absolutely have these conversations and they are um equally comfortable um, you know learning these the varna mother or the sakhi or any of these compositions so it's only when you are able to explore that truly um these compositions are way too rich for us to write them off <laughs> as outdated or traditional Ma'am, uh, Lavanya here may ask my question. Yes, Lavanya, please go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Uh, namaste, ma'am. Wonderful session. Um, like, I if if at all, you know, like uh, my I have series of questions, so I have broken them down to the most simplest one for you. When exactly should I start teaching last year to my students? Mm. That that's how. Okay, your first question. Let me answer one at a time because I have trouble remembering. Yes, ma'am. Um, yes, ma'am. Teaching is—it's um, not. I don't think last year can be taught in a systematic manner like we would say, um, you know, teach uh, adults, right? So, see, Bharatanatyam or any dance form, any of our dan- dance forms are inherently equipped with last year. now like i said this last year is very subjective to each dancer each student so we cannot teach it as a one size fits all lesson right so if i look at one dance one of my students the last year in her is different from another one so it's my job as the teacher to ex- help her understand that to help her explore it so that level of understanding of last year would come at a much later stage. a uh, stage of learning right but i think fr- even from day 1 there is um it's more about the teacher understanding where that last year exists in the particular student and then when the time is right you will know how to guide them towards their last year not towards a one size fits all last year excellent uh, so ma'am again last year in rutta i am just facing all my questions for the for uh, helping me understand how to better teach my students the yeah. adavs yeah. so uh, my next question would be um, like how uh, what are the aspects that i should focus while teaching adavs that will make them their dance look beautiful filled with last year um so i think bharatanatyam is so filled with beauty that if we are teaching it to them in 
you know, in the correct manner, in the sense, making sure that, you know, what are we doing in uh, class one to, you know, when they're young, where, whatever age, uh, six or eight, whenever they come. In the beginning, we are looking at form and line and um, where that aramandi is and how, how are they able to hold their hastas. Those are the parts we're focusing on. Now, you know, when we look at a static form like Nataraja, there is so much lasya in that. So even when the child is holding that Aramandi or that Natya Rambam, there is Lasya in that already, right? So there is inherent Lasya in that. Now, it's not something that I feel can be superimposed on the student or dancer, right? It's not something that your notion as a teacher, my notion of Lasya is what I superimpose on. Like I said, it, this, this answer is actually similar to the previous answer in the sense that um, each one is different. So e we're all different human beings, different students, different dancers. So it's, again, I repeat, very, very important to understand um, each student's last year as the teacher and ex help them explore that rather than you um, inserting or me inserting my notion of last year on that child. Thank you, ma'am. That answers, you know, like I'll explore more. My only concern was that if the children are becoming very rigid uh, in seeking the perfection, uh, mm -hmm. like is there a miss out on uh, the grace? But see, the children, what are they going to do? They are going to do what the teacher tells them to do, right? At least in the beginning, that's what they're going to do. So you as the teacher... Um, since you are asking this question, you're obviously aware of that. So it, you will, I'm sure, be guiding them in the right direction, right? So it depends on teacher. And some teachers, I think, um, prefer to teach in that manner. And it's not, you know, it's not, uh, I, I think we can live and let live. <laughs> it's like we're all, it's all beautiful. But as long as the... There is only good and bad, right? So in terms of uh, what we observe and uh, whether it is touching me, whether it is making me feel something when I watch a dancer is what I look for. So if you as a teacher are asking these responsible questions, then you are already on the path to helping them understand this. So it's not really the student that decides from a very early time. Um, yes, they are influenced by a lot of what they see around them. Um, and But then if they are coming to you as the teacher, they are looking for your guidance, your direction. Um, so that's where I would leave that. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thanks a lot. Sure. Hello, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am, for the session. I'm a great fan of yours. Have seen, uh, used to see your performance from my young age. So thank you so much. My pleasure. Can I get your number, ma'am, and that link also? Uh, the link. You mean for the for the yeah data. something you have written you told no? Yes, I will send. I will send. Forward it to the group. I'm guessing. Uh, details of yeah. Okay. Or if you go on YouTube eventually, right? Hello, Namaste. Namaste. I'm Girija. Um, I, I'm really appreciating your talk. I didn't start from the beginning, but I've been teaching um, Bharatanatyam for many years now. And I absolutely um, agree with you. Very beautiful way of explaining it um, and explaining what is last year. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. My pleasure. <laughs> Good. Like Thank I said, the beginning, based on my somatic experience of 45 years of dancing, so yes. it's experiential, it's not necessarily from theory books or anything. It's just what my body has experienced and learned on its own is what I was talking about, essentially. Yes, I, and I, I also appreciate a lot what you said about the, you know, the, uh, the, the whether it is old songs or new songs, whatever pleases you. And you bring the best out of that. 
and when you do it it's you for the present when you are present you are present and you are dancing it's yeah. a very beautiful way of explaining i'm so glad thank you so much so yeah. many people are listening to you so good absolutely and all, all the best taking it beyond it's also how you're able to connect with the person who's uh, receiving your yes. answer, right and each, yes. Yes. with each person in the audience it's a different connection it's a one on one connection the way i look at it so yes. it's uh, it's all of it. yes thank you yeah thank you bye do we have more questions from the audience in case you have a problem with your microphone please do feel free to uh, type it on the chat and uh, we can read it out for you as well reshma i have one more question may i ask yes lavanya ma'am if okay. it's okay with you we'd uh, like to go on yeah exactly uh, ma'am uh, again you know sorry i am in only one place uh, nritta lasya in nritta can you please explain ma'am i'm just looking for cues so that i can better myself well i talked about it uh, in the beginning where you were you present from the yes. beginning of the talk okay yes yes so the yes. first part of my talk was essentially about lasya and ritta right the physical yes. the part of the body so when we take movements we cannot cut them into pieces you know we have um, each movement that leads to the next movement that leads to the next movement and that it just goes on it's it's a constant flow that's very important in nritta so if we are holding a a hand a natya rambam where is that going next is the adab going above your head then how is that flow from this to this happening um so every moment has to be taken in adavas or and nritta to uh, uh, to specifically answer your question to look at that um flow to look at that flow and that's where the lasya exists it's not in the individual movements but it is in the connections between the movements ma'am is there any set rule that you know uh, like once the hand is in natya rambam position uh, the, uh, like even uh, for example uh, let me be very specific suppose i hold for one adavu i hold a tripataka hasta from that tripataka hasta uh, is it necessary uh, to continue in tripataka or to move to kataka mukha like somewhat you know like that's an individual choice lavanya it's not like again it's not what i say that you know that is uh, vedavaku or you know this is written in any <laughs> so it's uh, it's something that you as a teacher i mean you you have this uh, you you know you the current you the present you is a culmination of what you've learned from your teachers and also what you're teaching your students we learn so much from teaching as well when we teach yes. is when we really learn i feel um and that when it is added to what you've learned so far from your own teachers you find a way through to understand how to work with each student um so it's not about tripataka has to stay tripataka it's you know it it is it to you does that jati allow it does it allow it to flow to katakamu go next does it allow does it say no it has to stay in tripataka i mean what is that it and it's also an emotional decision right so what looks good what feels good um it's a combination of those two so it's a very individual choice it's not something that can be generalized and said this is right or that is wrong um like i said if the dancer connects with me and i feel something when i watch her or him then they've done their job wow thank you so much ma'am thank you yes, ma'am i not seeing any que- more questions from the audience but before we wrap up um, i just wanted to also uh, ask you something especially about the uh, friday feminine series that you're doing yeah sure. so this question might uh, be a little more on to that I side did, i did it during the pandemic uh, the pan- five, yes five days and uh, or more yeah i don't remember yeah yes. uh, so right now as well uh, we were always talking about uh, the feminine energy and uh, uh, the flow 
but my question is like how you were talking about in your series uh, where uh, the world sort of conditions our mind mm -hmm. uh, that this is how the female energy should behave this is how the male energy should be portrayed similarly in dance as well uh, sometimes uh, are we conditioning our naikas uh, to behave in a certain manner our heroes to respond in a certain manner like Uh, just today you gave the example of uh, krishna in ashtapadi where uh, he is probably uh, the only one who uh, we talk about in a certain way that uh, the way he is responding at least we have a lot of uh, songs based on that uh, but there are is many men who are like waiting yearning loving forgiving at least uh, let sorry for using the word again but the traditional format yeah why is that well we need more composers to write about that right to to write and see historically we have had a tremendous number of uh, male composers um but not too many female composers for dance right so or the comp the compositions or poems of uh, written by women have been washed away hidden not really brought to the light, brought to light um so we are unfortunately as a result there is a paucity of comp uh, compositions written by women perhaps if more women came forward to write compositions they might write from the other point of view um everybody from you know papana sanshivan the mujay deva we try to take utkarde venkata so we we take every all male all male kshetraya i mean uh, sarangapani <laughs> everyone right so um if we get more women composers women poets to speak up to write their you know uh, voices what they want to voice uh, if we let listen to those voices maybe we'll see more of that maybe we'll see more of that um but then there are compositions um you know where i mean definitely with krishna as the protagonist there are many compositions um and there are uh, many undiscovered lav uh, you know jabalis and other compositions which um i i mean it's not that i know of them but i have heard of many undiscovered compositions which have the male as the main character um uh, yearning and um, all of the other emotions that you talked about so it's just that we haven't searched for them enough they're there um we just need to search for them a little more and combined with that perhaps get more written now <laughs> more compositions written now by uh, poets who are uh, truly able to envision that you know that emotion thank you thank you for that um yes any more questions i don't see any on the chat if not uh, we will slowly start wrapping up okay okay vidya yes. ma'am thank you so much and uh, again i'm coming back to what the hindu wrote about you when they said that uh, they've left the emotional audience enthralled i'm sure that's exactly what the team here is also experiencing Thank you so much for spending time with us and agreeing to do so. Uh, you just mentioned you had a recording yesterday as well. We we know you're tightly packed. Uh, even after we had to even postpone uh, the session. So thank you, thank you so much for joining us, ma'am. My absolute pleasure. Thank you, Reshma, and thank you to those of you, all of you who have joined today, and uh, look forward to more interactions in the future. Take care, everyone, and happy dancing, please. keep dancing